It is my pleasure now to share some of the key insights of this mentioned report uh, focused on the financial aspects. And I will also focus on a Germany case study. We've looked at uh, six countries, but there's not so much time, so I'll speak about Germany mostly. Now, we have looked at the connectivity also in financial aspects, um, but we started with looking at shared narratives of uh, marches and meetings of transnational relevance, music events and violent sports, obviously. And we have found out, and uh, that's the core thesis of this report, that a new leaderless transnational and apocalyptic violent extreme right-wing movement has emerged. And by that we mean as uh, some sort of organized collect unorganized collective, not a classic organization with a strict hierarchy, but connected and united by shared narratives, values, and enemies. That's just another teaser for you to look into that report. Now let's dive into financial activities and strategies of uh, our target group in Germany. Um, one of Germany's leading or very visible extremists said it very clearly, the only way to build structures is commercial success. So we have on one hand the old school self-financing donations uh, uh, developments. We have some information about what is going on in the cryptocurrency um, arena, but uh, we're still thinking that um, this needs definitely more research. We have concerts have been ongoing for decades, of course, but the size and the professionalism of some festivals has dramatically increased. Up to 6,000 participants um, from more than a dozen countries, hence the transnational connectivity, an, an estimated revenue here of up to 2 million euros just in 2018. This is being collect, uh, calculated by taking the uh, participants and assuming around 50 euros being spent per person, including the ticket and then uh, some other things like food, drinks, t-shirts, CDs. We have big MMA events. Also, fighting events are nothing new, but the size and the professionalism and the transnational aspect are new. So here you have six, eight, nine hundred people attending these events, which leads to 40,000 to 50,000 estimated in revenue for each of those events. So these are significant numbers. This is not about... Um, uh, self-financing or some small donations. We have of course had forever the mail order business, but there's a level of professionalism in the merchandise business. You get a uh, good quality sweaters, uh, sportswear, you get all kinds of t-shirts, gimmicks, um, you get food supplements. There is a strong subculture related to the, the warrior spirit uh, connecting to the MMA events where a lot of money seems to be uh, changing hands. And we have several organizations simply in Germany, um, uh, companies that make more than or several hundred thousand euros a year turnover revenue here. And we have real estate. Um, more than 140 properties are owned by extreme right-wing individuals in Germany. And this is relevant, and I'll uh, talk to this in a second why. And as I mentioned, the transnational dimension of this, this is about Germany, but we found a lot of connectivities to other uh, countries, particularly the ones, of course, we looked into in the report. Now imagine this would be the Islamist extremist scene in Germany. What would we do? What would governments do? What would civil society be asked to do? This looks like quite a package. So concerts and festivals are particularly interesting to us because they don't follow the usual market logic. There are four key components that make them different to other public events that are reducing costs and uh, potentially uh, secure much higher profit margins. They are held on private property often, not always, but often by either, either sympathizers or by extreme right-wing individuals themselves. Also house rules apply, which makes the whole management of the situation easier. They are often registered as political events, sometimes by members of extreme right-wing parties, which also brings free police protection for the event. We have entry fees or tickets that are uh, designated tax-free because they are declared as donations. 
which they are obviously not. And uh, there's some work here to be done to look into this more. And of course, the security services around these and within these events um, are mostly made up of extreme white wing individuals who have security companies or who cooperate with uh, Kameradschaften, bands of extremists, or with bikers and hooligans and organized crime. So we're, we just scratched the surface here and we already found some very interesting findings. So coming to an end, challenges and opportunities. My point would be that we don't know the real size and nature of the extreme right-wing REM-T phenomena. We are unclear in the EU and beyond on definitions. We are unclear on designa designations and therefore we are also unclear on statistics. So it's like really, it depends on how we look at the phenomenon, how uh, professional, how with what kind of uh, background, how coordinated, and, and with what kind of funding that will show us um, that there's much more to find. That is at least the finding of our research that we did in, in three months. Under-researched and potentially misunderstood by that, I mean, the extreme right-wing violence often appears to be a no-flag operation. So I'm a political scientist. I was taught that terrorism means a declaration. There's a political message that comes with the violence. And this is often true, but it's very often not true in the extreme right wing. The, the, the violence, for example, in Germany and other countries we looked into is often not being classified as political violence because there's no explanation, uh, no declaration surrounding it. Um, but it can have, and this is one thing we need to look into, more the nature of a low intensity warfare situation where there's thousands uh, at the end of the day, individuals, for example, in Germany, committing violent crimes or being involved to some degree in preparation, covering up, fundraising for it without declaring what they're actually doing. So this is a challenge. And the other is the attacker bias us looking at um, the costs of the specific attack, which is often not a lot of money, right? It's the same with Islamist extremism. Um, uh, there are sophisticated, uh, complicated, expensive attacks, and there's very cheap attacks where you get actually a loan from your local bank for it. So here we have to look at the supporting environment. As we mentioned before, the transnational narratives, the transnational collective uh, based on values, norms, narratives, and enemies. We have not enough research regarding the crime and extreme white connectivities. Biker hooligans, we run into those all the time when we look at the right-wing extremist violence oriented uh, groups and individuals, but there's not a lot of publicly of research publicly available, let's say that. And also since our um, federal police announced that they will invest more in researching that, investigating that, I guess there's much more to do. Last point, as long as designation of groups and individuals, as mentioned by previous speakers, are maybe not possible at the moment, a focus on administrative measures uh, like um, interventions by um, local authorities, for example, banning events due to security risks, banning alcohol at concerts. Um, uh, there's a German concept that might exist in other places called Gefährderansprache, meaning you go to the individuals you know before specific events and you tell them, we know that you're going to go there. If you commit any minor crime, we're going to go after you. Uh, retracting Schengen visa, there's a lot of things that can be done if designation of groups or individuals is not on the table right now. Germany has a wide array of experiences here, yet uncoordinated, but uh, definitely with lessons to be learned and lessons to be shared. Thank you for that. Thank you, Alexander. I really appreciate uh, the, the uh, summary presentation of, of the findings of our recent report. Um, fantastic start to the panel. And the next two speakers, Tom Keating and Kyla Eisenman, both work, both work for the Royal, Royal United Services Institute, RUSI, in London. Tom is the founding director of the Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies at RUSI, where his research focuses on matters at the intersection of finance and security, including the use of finance as a tool of intelligence and disruption. 
He has a master's in intelligence and international security from King's College London, where his research focused on the effectiveness of counterterrorism finance regime. Prior to joining Rusi in 2014, he was an investment banker for 20 years at JP Morgan. Kyla Eisenman is a research analyst at Rusi's Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies. Her primary research focuses on analyzing and addressing the financial crime risks posed by cryptocurrencies, including sanctions evasion, money laundering, and terrorism financing. In May 2019, she co-authored the paper Fundraising for Right-Wing Extremist Movement, which focused on identifying and addressing extreme right-wing financing channels, especially in regard to emerging technologies, and she has continued to monitor this space ever since. Prior to joining Rusi, Kyla worked at the U.S. Department of Commerce and the U.S. Department of State. Tom and Kyla, the screen is all yours. I'm looking forward to your presentations. Great, uh, Hans, thank you very much. Um, so I will uh, uh, take the floor first. Um, so yes, Hans, thanks to you and to the Convening States for inviting us to contribute today. Um, as mentioned, I'm the director of the Centre for Financial Crime and Security Studies at the London-based research institute, RUSI, where um, our programme focuses on issues at the intersection of finance and security, including, of course, a focus on the financing of terrorists and other forms of extremist activity. And over the last couple of years, we've spent quite some time studying the financial activity of uh, extreme right actors. So this short intervention allows us to introduce that work as it relates to the audience we have today. Uh, and then uh, Kayla will speak specifically about cryptocurrencies. So I work in this field, uh, and there are two examples of papers uh, here on the right-hand side, looks at how right-wing terrorists and extremist movements and individuals raise funds and how this should be reflected in counter-extremism and counter-terrorism financing strategies. In summary, we make the following observations. The response to terrorist financing has been built to combat a threat that is group-based on the whole, and secondly, a threat that is jihadi-focused on the whole, if you think about all the activity since 9-11 in this sphere. And it thus follows that these existing responses may not lend themselves to being effective when facing down threats that do not meet these two criteria. Where the targets of the international community have been terrorist, the tools and strategies developed have been built on and underpinned by international law as promoted by the United Nations. So for example, Security Council Resolution 1373 or the 1999 International Convention for the Suppression of the Financing of Terrorism. And of course, the globally agreed standards and norms that are curated by the Financial Action Task Force. Moreover, in addition to operational considerations, it's also the case that responses to terrorist financing are often predicated on those that are the subject to these potential actions being recognized as terrorists in the eyes of the law, as most of the legal powers used by law enforcement and the criminal justice system are unlocked by this designation. Thus, where groups or individuals have not been designated or prescribed as terrorists, these tools are not applicable. I think one of the things we must all look at more closely are other disruption activities that we could consider, and I'm interested to hear the points that Alexander was making just now uh, in that regard. So this gap highlights a further issue to consider the need for the articulation of a more robust legal definition of extremism and greater willingness of governments to engage at a strategic and political level with the threats posed by right-wing extremism. This a good An increased understanding of extreme right fundraising strategies, including the relevance of significant numbers that may assist the private sector in identifying suspicious transactions, is also required. As elaborated in the Rusi Journal article uh, that's been mentioned, extreme right sources of funding are generally similar to the typical sources drawn upon by other loan and small cell actors. Legitimate earnings, government benefits, petty crime and fraud. Online calls or donations are also common, as we've heard, and crowdfunding and social media are popular tools. But some variations exist too, uh, and we've heard about those already from Alexander. So in summary, the financing extreme right activity is generally unremarkable, which is why a greater focus should be placed on the intelligence value of finance for supporting the identification and disruption of extreme right actors. Greater collaboration between public and private sectors must be promoted in order to enable the identification and disruption of extreme right related and enabling funding. But I think we would caution that outsourcing the tackling of extreme right financing to the private sector, taking advantage of the banking sector's sensitivity to reputational risk, should not be a shortcut to a better defined extremist financing policy and legal framework from governments. And finally, extreme right threats must not be viewed as merely domestic. 
It's an increasingly transnational and network threat. And greater understanding of financial connections can provide valuable support in identifying these transnational links. At which point I will thank you, Hans, and hand over to Kayla. Hi, thanks, Tom. Uh, and thanks again for inviting us both to speak today. Uh, as mentioned, I'm just going to briefly touch on the intersection of cryptocurrency and the extreme right. So I've started off here with a quote, uh, which I think illustrates people's views towards this topic. So in 2017, Richard Spencer, who you will probably know is an infamous American right wing extremist, tweeted that Bitcoin is the currency of the alt right. But despite the seeming convergence of his alt-right's distrust of government and support of decentralization and emphasis on privacy, cryptocurrencies actually have yet to play that huge crucial role in financing the extreme right, at least that we've seen. There's been historic interest by extreme right groups in various alternative payment systems, especially once they've had issues with credit card providers uh, or bank transfers. Um, so they've looked to PayPal, Patreon, iTunes gift cards, the Apple Store, etc. But the ability of those companies, excuse me, the ability of those companies in turn to deplatform users and close their accounts has led to an increased interest in cryptocurrency specifically, which we've definitely seen. The interest is certainly there. There's also increasing evidence of cryptocurrency being used for other forms of terrorist financing, as illustrated by U.S. seizures of terrorist cryptocurrency accounts this past summer. If you haven't read the U.S. indictments and about the seizures, I really would highly recommend it. Um, however, despite those two separate issues, we've actually really yet to see use case in funding right wing terrorism specifically. As Tom mentioned, there's sort of a definitional uh, difficulty there where we're talking about extremism versus terrorism. We've certainly seen it play a role in extremism, but not so much terrorism. There are certainly crowdfunding donations being sent to far right actors um, that I'm sure you're all aware of. You just have to look at the Twitter account at neo-Nazi wallets to get a sense of the scale of that. For example, I've gone through to one of those transactions. That's what you can see on the screen here on the right, exactly. Um, in July, over 12,000 US dollars were sent to Andrew Arnheimer, who you might know of as Weave is his username. Um, and that's just one transaction that is highlighted on that Twitter account. So when I'm, but the thing is, when I mentioned their emphasis on privacy, the, looking at this sort of screenshot is part of the reality of how Bitcoin, for example, works. Um, these transactions are publicly available online, even if the sender is anonymous. So a lot of the illusion of privacy that comes with cryptocurrency is just that, an illusion, especially with blockchain tracing and analytics tools readily available to both law enforcement and exchanges that are being used in this system. That being said, there also is an increased interest in privacy coins, um, but we again have not seen that at any large scale. Similarly, cryptocurrency exchanges and wallet providers actually often act in the same capacity as banks would in the traditional financial system, requiring some level of compliance checks and monitoring for red flags, such as some of those key numbers that you may have heard of um, and that we discussed further in our article. As Tom mentioned as well, this is far from a domestic problem, especially with the added level of cross-border payments that are enabled by something like cryptocurrency, as opposed to a more domestic currency that would require um, currency changes. You can simply send it to whoever you want, wherever you want in the world. And therefore, it really requires the attention of both the crypto industry itself, as well as the associated financial institutions. And of course, as I also saw uh, one of the questions in the Q&A touched on, the full investment of law enforcement and of the public sector, because one of the big issues here is that law enforcement can sometimes lack the knowledge needed in order to conduct investigation. So the outcome is looking promising. There have been huge um, adjustments and progress in regulation and in law enforcement capacity even in the last year or so, uh, but there's certainly a lot more work to be done here. Super fantastic, dear Kyla, dear Tom. Great presentation. I really, really appreciate this. Um, and as since you mentioned it, I want to again encourage everyone to post a question in the Q&A window, if you go down with your cursor on the screen, the toolbar appears on the right side, Q&A, F and R, because we are coming now to the last presentation, but not the least presentation of this panel uh, from my colleague, Dr. Kate Hemingby. Dr. Kate Hemingby is a former research fellow at the Norwegian Police University College, now working in the government sector. 
He is also connected to CIRIX, the CIRIX Center for Research on Extremism in Oslo, and his research focus is on terrorist target selection issues, police response, counterterrorism strategies, and intelligence. He has written and contributed to several books and articles on these matters. Cato will focus today on the financial activities of one of the most notorious uh, right-wing terrorists, um, Andres Breivik. Cato, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. The screen is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Hans Jakob, and, and I'm happy to contribute to it. Let's see, just a minute. There we are, I hope. Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting uh, seminar. Uh, it's been great so far, so I hope we'll keep that way. I've been asked to say some uh, words about the uh, very special case of Anders Berg and the 22nd July attacks in Norway. This was a right-wing solo terrorist ideolo ideology tuned towards saving Europe from takeover from Muslims in particular. This narcissist could never settle for one or several small attacks, as if that would be a waste of his talent, in his own words. So he chose to do a one-off cruel shock operation, aiming to kill hundreds of people. Then he knew he would gain maximum media attention, as well as to ensure him a place in the Hall of Fame for terrorists. Uh, Breivik's hatred was in particular aimed towards the Labour Party and the media, and he ended up by killing eight people with a bomb in the government quarter in Oslo, and 69 people in the shooting attack on the island Utøya, where the Labour Party's youth organization had an annual summer camp. There were several special characteristics of this case, but two central elements were Breivik's robust financial starting point and the long timeline. Regarding the, financing, uh, the financing part, we can see this in three phases. In the first phase, from 2002 to 2006, Breivik committed ordinary criminal activity, seemingly without any political motive. He earned about 580,000 US dollars from selling fake US university documents and certificates. He used foreign bank accounts and in-between company, uh, companies, for example, in Antigua in the Caribbean and in Dominica in the West Indies. He also established bank accounts in the Baltic states. So he avoided tax on most of his income and moreover, his mother also helped him with a money laundering process involving some performa loan documents between them. And she also opened three bank accounts. So it worked uh, like this. He gave her cash, which she put into her own accounts before she transferred the money back to him. Around 60,000 US dollars was uh, laundered this way. A part of the huge uh, profit went into the stock market without any significant success. The second phase, going from 2006 to 2009, started when he moved into his mother's flat then quite radicalized. At the time, he claims he had about 90,000 US dollars in savings and 45,000 US dollars in cash. That meant a very good financial starting points since he had very low living expenses living with his mother. And accordingly, he could skip ordinary work and fully concentrate himself on his terrorist project. So both his financial position and the uh, long time frame compensated for the fact that he had to do everything himself and not being part of a group or a cell. Moving to the third phase from uh, 2009 to 2011, Breivik now went from thinking to acting with his practical and operational preparations. In the middle of May, 2009, he registered an agricultural company in order to be able to rent a farm and also to buy fertilizer sometime in the future. Importantly for our context here in September, October 2009, he also applied for and got 10 credit cards giving him about $38,000 in reserve. From then on, he continued in more detailed planning. He invested in weapons, bomb ingredients, and other things he needed. He used his savings and cash all the way here. When possible, cash was of course preferred in order not to leave any electronic 
uh, traces. Late autumn 2010, Breivik started the search for a suitable farm, but what they thought would be a quick fix was to take him actually six months, and this delayed him profoundly. So in April 2011, he signed a contract for a farm about 150 kilometers northeast of Oslo from the 1st of May. Four days after it came into effect, he moved in, but now his target planning was all messed up because his preferred target events for the shooting attack part were held in April and already gone. These were the Scoop Investigative Journalist Conference and his reserve shooting attack was the Labour Party's annual convention, and both were over. So it was at this point Utøya and the youth camp came up as a shooting attack target to be, just because it was the best alternative at the time. More importantly here, however, when he moved to the farm, all his savings and cash had gone. And now he had turned to the 10 pre-collected credit cards and this was very much due to unexpected expenses the perpetrator in hindsight meant he should have foreseen. And this actually worried him a great deal because if he couldn't pay his credit card bills, he would highly likely become su subject to an insolvency registration in central registers, which again could make it impossible for him to rent the two vehicles he needed for the operation Although the escape car was rented in early April, so that was okay in a way, but the crafter one he used as the bomb vehicle, he rented just a week before the attack itself. In addition to the pressure due to the lack of money, he was stressed by the fact that the street leading to the uh, building in the government quarters was to be permanently closed for security reasons in the near future. And he had always also been worried that a jihadi cell arrested in Oslo in and Oslo and Germany in 2010 uh, would speed up the street closure. Furthermore, when uh, an info explosives are in the making, you have a certain time slot to use them, of course. So all in all, in July 2011, Breivik was no longer in position to postpone his action, uh, his operation. And on the uh, 22nd July, he con conducted the brutal attacks, and uh, the rest is uh, history, really. So, in conclusion, Breivik's financial criminal activity enabled him to do the long term complex terrorist operation. He did exploit the ex possibilities foreign financial institutions represent and could do so with a fairly low risk of uh, detection. He exploited uh, the credit card possibilities in order to establish important uh, financial reserve. He deliberately used cash when he could, so he didn't leave uh, any traces. And you have also heard how the insolvent registration system became a constraint for him operationally. So seemingly small efforts can have impact on terrorists. All in all, I think a deep dive into this case will illustrate how important it is to put, uh, put even more effort into countering terrorism financing through international cooperation and also on the national arena. And this on a political, strategic and operational level. And with that, I can uh, hand the word uh, over to you again, Hansi.